So, I guess by way of introduction, um, I've had some reviews. The book is called The Serpent Papers. It's published March 1st. Uh, it is my first book. It's a novel. It's a historical novel. It's about things that happened in 1971 and 72 at Columbia University in New York. Um, I've had some reviews. It's in the New York Journal of Books. For some reason, it's not all fitting on the page there. But you can also see the description of Times Dispatch. It is something from the Fredericksburg newspaper, Fredericksburg Lance Star, I think it is. It's a paperback. 
and it's sent out to reviewers. Mm. And then I go over it further with the copy editor, and if there's anything left to change, we can change it after that. I think there was one major change in the book after the previous edition. So there is a printing actually before the publication. That's how it works. Uh, so anyway, this is uh, a synopsis of the circuit in the plane itself. I, I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever. So anyway, um, let me say this about the book. The Vietnam War era of generation, and I guess that's us, baby boomers. The Vietnam War is still the defining event of our lives. It created a generational rift between those who fought and supported the war on one hand and those who protested against it. The American political atmosphere was polarized in the extreme in those days, much like it is today on a different issue. I should also say that I have a Facebook author's page, and I have one posting that has had over, and this, it just hit over 500,000 hits. It has about um, 12,000 likes, or 12,000 likes, most of them are likes, some of them are lives, sad, happy <laughs> again. And, and there's, there's been about 7,000 comments and shares, about 50 50. Mm -hmm. So there are people on the site making comments. And you can see the rift in our generation. You know, some of these people are saying, you know, those hippies who protested, they should be firebombed or sent to the front lines, or they should be shot against the wall. And then there are people who protested or who were more against the war saying, you know, other things. And it, sometimes there's a lot of bitterness in these comments. Sometimes there are people who are very analytical and there's a lot of that discussion. But you can see there's a rift in our generation. And I've seen that um, firsthand. It still persists. Um, and um, so the book itself, as it's by way of synopsis, uh, it's a historical novel about a main character named J.D. He's a southern boy, he's from Norfolk, Virginia, he's from a military family, and he was brought up by a father who's a rear admiral in Norfolk, and he's expected to go into the military. But things happen in his childhood of a somewhat violent nature, a disturbing nature, which turns him off to going into the military, and he ends up going to college instead, goes to Columbia in New York. His best friend, this he goes to Vietnam. Um, so when he gets to Columbia in 1971, he's thrust into an anti-war atmosphere that he wasn't anticipating. And it's, there's a culture in the cauldron of anti-war protest at Columbia. His, he uh, has a girlfriend when he's there. She is against the war. He's torn between these two poles of sort of ideologically supporting his best friend who's in Vietnam and seeing the rationale for ending the war that his girlfriend espouses. So he's torn between these two polar opposites about the war, much like our whole generation. He is a prototype of our generation. And he's trying to figure out where he stands, how he fits, what his views are, because he sees the rationale of the war he sees the problems of the war that his girlfriend is talking about. And while he is at Columbia, he becomes a paradigm for our generation, straddling both sides of the issue, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, as the war escalates and comes to a head, and there are ratcheting tensions, full war is blasting on campus, and the demonstrations, there's a culmination in a riot on the campus of Columbia, which actually is depicted in the book, is a factual occurrence. It is a historical event. And I actually was an eyewitness to it. And I what did I did protest against the war, so I was present at this demonstration which turned into a riot. And at that moment, JB, my main character, as the riot begins, as the problem, as the violence begins. He has to, he is, he is there, he has to decide what side of the issue he's on. He takes a stand and defines his life. So that's basically a synopsis of the book. Um, I myself had 
had been haunted by the Vietnam War for 50 years. Um, as a teenager, um, and that includes in college, uh, in fact, there's even, there's even a picture in here somewhere of me as a teenager. You can see me walking around.
can't really say wars are good things. They're not. Uh, they're part of human history. But this World War II was a righteous war. Vietnam may not have been quite as righteous a war. The, the lines were not as clear cut as to why we were there. But there were definite reasons. I mean, the Cold War came after World War II. It was a you know, arms race. We remember people building bomb shelters in their backyards, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I remember grade school. They would have air raid drills in high school, and yeah. they would have us hide yeah. under our desks. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll say that. that. <laughs> <laughs> so we hide them under the desk. I'm thinking to myself, if we had a bomb that's going to blow up the East Coast, you know, how old is my baby? Fine. If it's going to blow up the world, how am I? Why am I sitting under these desks? <laughs> <laughs> they had this bomb shelter in one school I was in. Which was like, it seemed like 100 feet deep, must have been maybe 50 feet below the surface. It was a lot of steps. And you all went down there. There were no windows, of course. Mm -hmm. And they closed the hatch. And it was the most claustrophobic thing. We're all sitting tightly, like sardines on the floor. And I'm saying, what am I supposed to live like this for how long? <laughs> you know, it's not sustainable. So basically, it was a scary time. The Cold War was scary. The arms race was real. The Aopig invasion, the Cuban Missile Crisis, all these things. There was Korean War to stave off the progression of communism to the south. You managed to draw a parallel there. And the, the roots for the Vietnam were very logical. And the American people saw that. I mean, you know, we had Korea, we divided the country in half. We're going to have Vietnam, we're going to divide the country in half. We don't want the unification of Vietnam. We don't want a communist country to be influenced the Soviet Union. So, uh, that was used to be underpinning the Vietnam War. The conflict was basically accepted by the American people. Uh, but then what happened was, at the time, it dragged on and on and on. And LBJ lied about the war as well. And he said, I remember in 1964, his, his campaign promise was, uh, we're not going to bomb Hanoi. We're not going to escalate this war. And while he was saying that, was he was actually, it came out later, he was actually planning to bomb the uh, Hanoi. At the very moment he was saying he was not, never going to do that. The Cold War came out and said, we're going to bomb Hanoi. <laughs> he was going to land the same thing. So it, it wasn't, you know, a lot of presidents, Eisenhower, Kennedy, in fact, it was John Forster Dulles, the Secretary of State of Eisenhower, who said, he's going to domino theory. So it's way back in Eisenhower's administration, the French left Vietnam. Americans decided to come in and have advisors <coughs> and accelerated that. By the time Kennedy came in, we were having, we had some men on the ground by the end of his tenure, and then OBJ, and of course Nixon. All right, so it, 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 it were, there was logic to the war, and the people behind it, but it, it became too much. We were having too many boys die, and had the war became the end of the staff protest. So it was very complicated. And this is what pointed. So I wanted, I wanted the war to end, but I understood the different sides. You know, and I, I saw protesters around me who were rabid, you know, as rabid as some people were rabid about fighting, you know, and killing those, killing dukes, the terrible things they said. Um, and I use the word, but I don't condone. I don't condone that use. But there were terms we. In terms of disparaging our enemy, there were people who were very involved in hating the enemy. And you could also argue, and it's argued in the book, that in fact, if you're going to fight a war, it's hard to love your enemy. If you're going to go out and kill somebody, you're really going to do it. Some people can't shoot most of the soldiers. So if you're really going to do it, you can't have love in your heart. You know, hatred is part of it. If it's part of what warps us when we go to war, it's part of the problem of fighting war. The hatred that people develop in, in the process of being at war. So anyway, it broke my heart and it, 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 it haunted me. And my response to it was, I became a physician. And I ran an, I, I ran an ICUs, I became an ICU doctor, a lung doctor. And I became a full professor of medicine, I ran a research laboratory, I was an editor of Journal Chess, which is a peer-reviewed, very fine journal, um, and I had a long history. I, I published maybe 50-odd things in medical 
journals, articles, research papers, all kinds of things. But I also, during that period of time, served full time in VA hospitals and ran an ICU and veterans administration for 15 years. So my response to the Vietnam War was, and I really wanted to, was to serve the veterans. Serve the veterans and give back what I couldn't give really during the war to support them. And that was my way of trying to do something for them. And you know, I saved a lot of lives. So I, I feel the end of my career, I retired a few years ago to make sure the book got published. Um, I retired, it was it 2020, I think. Um, that was, I felt satisfied I had given back. And with the book, I feel satisfied now that if anybody would read it, it's a roadmap to sort of curing the ills, the, the, the bitterness that surrounded the issue of the Vietnam War for our generation, which is really what I want to, to accomplish. And there is another character in the book who's a World War II veteran who brings the perspective of World War II into the picture. There are other perspectives in the book, so it, it attempts to cover an entire range of topics. So I think that's. I have more to say about authoring a book because I've heard you might be interested in it. But for now, maybe if you have any questions about the book itself, or I'd say. Why don't you read the first chapter? Uh, well, is there any questions in the book? About the Vietnam era, about uh, the book dealing with the era? I think it's very interesting. <laughs> Why did you not have to get? You said you were going to say something. Oh, yeah. Um, I had a draft number. Oh, here we go. My number was too hot for the draft. Number. And um, I was elated, to be honest with you. I wanted to go to war. Um, I guess one of the characters in my book did. But he had a rude awakening when he got there, as so many soldiers did. So many of them suffered from PTSD. I took care of so many of them who had it. Um, so, but yeah, that's the answer. But I had colleagues at school who disappeared. Their draft number was number three. They went to the freshman hall and his number was three. He was gone. He was gone. Well, my, my first husband, he uh, was a college and his draft number came up. But he didn't have to serve because they found that he had a brain tumor. He oh, said, yeah. What to be thankful for? You know? That's really terrible. That's a story. story. Did, he, did he pass away from it? Not from it. Well, he passed away at age 57. He had the tumor when he was like 19. So but, it was a benign, more of a benign tumor. Yeah, it was benign, but the, it was on the pituitary. And they, then uh, they did a different, the whole skull sort of surgery. If before you had all the technology you have today, and they took part of the pituitary for a tumor that was the size of a pea. Yeah. And we think maybe that had, because the doctors told them that might have shortened your life. Not having, and that was before the pills, but they were told who to take if you ever got ill. Or now you can get them, you can get them, anybody can get them. <laughs> Well, Beth wants me to read uh, a part, the first part, the first opening of the book, and, but I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not going to do it. Because, uh oh. Uh, well, I mean, it, you know, it's words? all so good. It's all so good. Oh, okay. Writing is so good. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Well, because, there are, <laughs> because there are more women in the audience, and uh, I told you there's a lot, there is violence. Um, there are five or six deaths in the book, murder, <clears throat> other kinds of deaths. Um, so it's it can be pretty. Um, it can be a downer. It can be tough. But it's but I I'm going to read you a part that's more romance, more about romance. It's a, it's when JB is with his girlfriend. It's from a chapter called Jump, um, which. Actually, it has been published. It's online at uh, the literary journal called 
Bright Launch, and which is where I published a lot of the chapters in my book um, before uh, the book actually was accepted for publication. And I should tell you a little more about that process if you're interested. I'll tell you how I, how I did that, how I sort of engineered that. But anyway, this this chapter called Jump is is a chapter where he's with his girlfriend and they're it's night and they're in bed together and so it's more of a, a romance and oh here it is. <clears throat> I lay on my back, bathed in the grays of urban night. Slats of light filtered in from the lamps on the avenue, projecting across the ceiling in diagonal beams. Flushes of red and white were moving in other directions, across the ceiling, coming and going, accompanying noises of tires on wet asphalt. Margot's face nuzzled the side of my chest under my arm. Her breath brushed against me in feathery waves. Her arm was draped over my chest. I purred, not daring to move. She murmured inaudibly. Hmm, I responded. I said, your hair's getting longer. I like it. Uh-huh. Then why aren't you wearing a cross? I thought Catholics wore crosses. I used to wear a cross, I said. Not anymore? Does that mean you've lost your innocence? An exile from the garden? Yeah, I suppose. The sisters would say I had fallen from grace. Would I tell this woman how I fell? of my torment at the hands of the sisters, of my tainted soul and evil deeds. The sisters, she touched her tongue to the side of my chest. What flavor am I today? Tell me, she said, about the sisters. The nuns, they were nuns. I still can't figure out whether they gave me hell because they knew, in that holy preordained way, that I was destined to be damned and so deserved to be punished. Or maybe they were intrinsically evil themselves and had wandered from the path of righteousness of their own accord, just people using God as a pretext to exact abuse against us boisterous boys. Or maybe there is no God. Maybe none of it really matters. Maybe the church and the sisters, the priests, and even the bishops, the cardinals, and the almighty Pope himself make the rules on earth merely to empower themselves while appearing righteous as they hide behind cloaks and finery. I don't know about all of them, but some of them are greedy, piggy-faced toads, feeding children, feeding off the nickels and dimes of the poor. Been beaten, J.B.? I nodded. I remembered their hard faces, their mouths, taut in the grimace of attack. I remembered getting hit, but it was the faces which told me I was an object of hatred. What did it do to you? She asked, worried. Did it twist you inside? Did it deform your soul? Probably. She sat up, propped herself on her arm and looked at me. She passed her hand over my chest, over the soft hair, and it felt good. I reached for her and kissed her. I stroked the curves of her buttocks and thighs, coming to rest on the fur of her deepest recesses. I wanted her. I wanted her, and I didn't want to share her with any other man. She had transported me to underground secret passages, to grottoes, secretly shrouding limpid tropical waters, surrounded by lush vegetation of the paradise that was her. I was lost in her, and love flowed from me like a river. It was powerful, and whether it lasted ten minutes or for all of eternity, there was no mistaking what I had discovered. Tell me a story, J.B. Tell me the story of your life before you got here. There's a lot to tell. There's always a lot to tell, and if you don't start, you'll never tell it. She had me cornered. I would be bearing the tender underbelly of my soul at the risk of being sliced to ribbons. If I confessed and revealed my story, it would rip from me like a torrent, and there would be no way of stopping it. I wanted to protest. I bleated like a sheep. You haven't told me a thing about you. She said nothing. I got a pair of cow's eyes. You want me to trust you, I managed to say. It's hard, I know, she said. It's harder than what you have to hide. I looked at her, the imp, now smiling in her face on my chest, licking me again. It's like mushrooms on your hamburger, she said. 
It's a new adventure in a terrifying labyrinth of life. Can you find a monster lurking in the maze? A tantalizing siren who will drown you? Or will you find the woman of your dreams? A woman who may protect you from the storms of life and more? Yes, JB, trust a woman and you may be injured, damaged, maimed beyond recognition. Trust a woman and you have everything to lose. But think what you might gain. Understanding, sympathy, and an end to the solitude, loneliness, and emptiness that is the hallmark of a hermetic male life. I looked at her again, my mind squirming like a worm on a hook. Christ, that is well put. It came out like a groan from a man who knew his destiny and had no power to alter its course. The cliff is there, she said. Jump. I looked at her in horror. Oh, what the hell, J.D.? Go and jump. What do you have to lose besides everything? I was in the grip of an intangible thing, <clears throat> pushing me forward like a lemming to the cliffs, promising elation while subjecting me to extreme risk, taking away all rational thought and laughing at my powerlessness. I stumbled forward and leapt from a precipice, and my life plunged into freefall. I told her that I was the son of a naval officer from Norfolk. I told her about my best friend, Gilly O'Daly, who went to Vietnam. I told her how I was beaten by the nuns and how their rigid behavioral rules got under my skin like bugs in my pajamas, and how I had lost it, acted out, rebelled, and railed against authority. I, hope, I told her how it made me do all kinds of bad things, and when I acted out, I paid for it with my skin. I didn't want to tell her more because I was afraid that I might lose her, that she might reject me, but I couldn't stop. Something within me wanted to be heard, forcing me to continue so that I finally told her what only Gilly knew. I had committed what society calls a felony and what the church calls mortal sin. I had taken revenge against my brother's killers with full premeditation, ambush ambushing them in a violent and savage act. Within the entire span of my young life, it may have been isolated as an act of depravity, but it was the one exception to my behavior that made me a sinner. It was the moment with the single most powerful impact on my soul. I told Margot everything about the planning and beating of Stankowitz and Lorraine and how it had changed my world. It was this event, I explained, that had been a catalyst to my choosing Columbia, a place where I imagined the forces of good and evil would come to face, face to face and battle for my soul. When I had finished, Margot lifted herself to my chest and, kissing my forehead, said, I had no idea that being a Catholic was so difficult. <laughs> then she hugged me and didn't let go. It had a strong effect. There was a trumpeting within me that shook the fortress walls of my soul until they tumbled down in submission, allowing light to penetrate where it had been absent for a very long time. Then the tumbling of the walls became the quaking of the earth, and the quaking of the earth became the convulsing of my torso. I was horrified. How could the telling of my story, the trusting of another soul, have such an effect? How could I be sobbing so uncontrollably without the power to stop? So, any more questions? Do you want me to talk about that? Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing that you would publish pieces, parts of the book. Yeah. Um, Online, is that? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, there's a, there's a couple of essays that, were, that are online, you can see them. And, you know, inside I have, um, I have some sheets of paper that sort of have places you can visit and things about the book. Um, but there's one called My Pilgrimage to Publication of the Serpent Papers, and it is um, an essay in, in something called Books Cover to Cover. And the two is a number two. Books cover to the dot com. So if you look on there, you can see this pilgrimage book. And also, there's this one I wrote about uh, more about Vietnam in the Ordeer Literary Magazine. So you mentioned the white bullets that you had published after. Yeah, uh, so how did I start? You know, it's a daunting task to try to market your book. Um, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> now, I guess writing a book was a hard part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, 
Well, let me go through it. This is an organized way. First of all, I began writing outside of work and school for many years before finding a publisher. My first novel was incomplete when I gave it up. My second novel was not good enough, in my judgment. Well, though Beth told me I should resurrect it, it I, we've sort of moved on to another, I'm writing another two books, and I don't really know how to go back. So that shows you how much goes by the wayside and gets mm -hmm. don't even use, at least for me. Um, the first thing I had to do was recognize my own flaws. And, you know, it's good to hear criticism. People give criticism, like I'm a member of the Columbia Fiction Foundry, which is a group which reviews, we review each other, we're all authors and review each other's work. I went to Columbia, but I can't have any character group. It has a, an author group. Many schools do. Uh, if you're not going to use your school group, the town groups, you have a group. Um, so, so you read each other's work and you criticize. Now, I've noticed that not all criticism is really worthwhile in school. You know, you're writing this book. You don't have to listen to all criticism. Sometimes it hurts, it's negative, but that doesn't mean it's right. And it doesn't mean that if you just do a couple of changes that have nothing to do with the criticism, that it wouldn't turn out to be brilliant. Uh, but when I hear a criticism from colleagues who read my stuff several times, she said I should drop this sentence, he said I should drop this sentence, they said I should drop it. Then I say, well, you know what? The sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's good to get a lot of values because if there's repetition in their criticisms, you use it. It means something. So I tried to recognize my own flaws. My characters initially were one-sided. My plots were totally underdeveloped, without tension and conflict and storyline. Which is, and, and the book, this book, is full of tension and conflict. Uh, my dialogues were somewhat stilted. I needed to work, and so I just needed to get as much criticism as possible. There were some some books that I read that helped me along the way. And these are the, it's in this article in um, my pilgrimage publication in books cover to cover. And I list them. So there's a book called The Art of Fiction by John Garth. And I rated it very helpful. There's a book called On Writing by Stephen King that I read. It's his personal journey. It was not so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned how to make it from me, but it didn't help me. Um, writing the blockbuster novel by Art Albert Zuckerman, who is a big agent in his day. He's now suffering from dementia, mm -hmm. so I'd say he left his firm. Um, I actually knew him, but I discovered in talking to him that he had some dementia and I realized he had. And then a year later, someone told me that he, quote unquote, he's out. But his book, writing a blockbuster novel, is very, very helpful. I found that extremely good. He talked about how to construct the plots. How, you know, I wouldn't write the plots that he, he talks about. And you know, did you ever hear the movie Eye of the Needle? Mm -hmm. Well, the book, uh, Sufferman's book, is about his, one of his most famous authors, and that's the guy who wrote the Eye of the Needle. I forget what his name is. Ken yeah. Paul, sorry, Ken Paul, Ken Paul, exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. Ken Paul. So the book is about how Ken Paul constructed things and how Zuckerman tore his stuff apart, and made a new life. It's very, very good. Um, there's a book on how to write a book proposal by Michael Larson. That's that's helpful. Then there's the Spooky Art uh, by Norman Mailer. It's an interesting narcissistic voyage into his author's journey. But it's not. The title is the best part of the speaker. <laughs> then there's one by Ronald B. Tobias called 20 Master Plots. <clears throat> this is superb. It's the most helpful book of all of them. And it goes over plots. I had a lot of problems with plots. Some people say, you know, they can write plots really easy. But if you have trouble with plots, that book is bad. So those are some book suggestions. Other things I did was I reread my the classics over and over again to see what successful books were. So I read Pride and Prejudice 25 times. That's not exaggeration. Um, 
<laughs> and I mean, Chandler, I wrote, I read some of his books 15 times in one book, Farewell, my lovely Persuasion by Jane Austen, Ernest Hemingway, Summers of Rises by Black Times, and lots of Shakespeare and Orwell. <coughs> and, you know, I watched great actors like Hugh O'Toole and Peter Brooks, King Lear, stuff like that. It, it just helped with my language. Um, so, what did I do? What did I do? I outlined my, I, where to start. So, I tried to write a plot, I outlined my book, and I realized that as soon as I started writing my book, I wasn't following my outline. <laughs> so, there are really two kinds of ways to write a book, I think. One is to, to write a formula, stick to it, and be rigid. And the other is to stick with your characters, let them do what they're going to do. You know, you can't have someone who's a sweet old lady suddenly come out and murder somebody with a knife. I mean, you know, if, if your character is not what you wanted them to be, then that character should not suddenly change wholeheartedly. The book will write itself if you have the right mix of characters and ideas. But <coughs> things change. So I was, I wrote like five or six outlines of intervals of like every six months to a year until I finally thought I was getting it right. But I was writing in the meantime, and I had to throw out the earlier outlines because they were just not going to happen. So I don't write according to form. I try and I fail, but I eventually actually do write the form itself. Um, and I rewrite everything. So for me, the prose has to flow. It should be smooth. And so I rewrote every single passage in this book, somewhere between three, and I remember one area was 15 times. I wrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. Mostly about five, six, seven times would be my average for rewriting in that book. Uh, every passage, every page, everything. Um, editors. Uh, I wanted the best editor I could get. So that was a challenge because editors are very expensive. Have you, did you have an editor? Okay. <laughs> now let me ask you what you charge. <laughs> But I mean, <laughs> editors can generally cost, if you're going to get a good editor, they'll cost you thousands of dollars. But if you get a bad editor, they'll still cost you thousands of dollars. And you may not know ahead of time what is a good editor and what isn't. <clears throat> so how did you find your editor? Well, what I did was, <coughs> I got extremely lucky. So I went online and I looked at all these editor sites. And I found an editor, <clears throat> so it was Richard Merrick, who had edited Hemingway. This was the guy, he was, he, he was in his 80s too, and he ended up dying of solid geo cancer. He was not good. Well, he was good. But he had edited Hemingway when he was a young man. He had edited James Baldwin. And he edited all of Robert Ludlum's books, and a lot of other things. He was also, at one point, the president of Dutton Books, and the publisher of Dutton Books. So he had a very long track record. But after Dutton Books, I think what happened was he left the publishing industry, probably because he wasn't invited back. You know, someone fired him, the Dutton books went down the tubes. I don't know what happened, I don't even know what happened. But he went off and decided to say, well, I can be an editor, I'm not a publisher. Um, and I wrote to him, he wanted a sample of my writing, and I sent him a sample of my writing. And he wrote back and he said, uh, your writing is extraordinary, I would like to edit your book, but it's gonna cost you. Mm -hmm. So, and actually, as it turns out, what he was charging was less than an editor wanted, whom I came into contact with later, for doing the same thing. She wanted twice as much. Mm -hmm. And I didn't let her edit the book. She read my book for like $500 and gave me some back. She said, but I will do a full edit of your book. It needs to be totally torn apart and written. Yeah. She was wrong. Um, and I said, well, I don't think so, you know, thank you. And um, then she was shocked to find out the book was being published like two months later. I just needed a second editor to go over a few weeks of mine. I died and I wanted a second opinion. Anyway, so it's hard to find an editor. But you have to apply the best ones, you have to apply them, and they tell you whether they'll take you or not. If other editors will just, well, they'll edit anything, you just pay them. Take, they'll, they'll edit your book. But, um, you know, what he did was he moved my chapters around. 
He read my book, he says, you know, your writing is great, but your first chapter has to be different. My first chapter had JV in school before he was in high school with the nuns and stuff. He said, no, first chapter has to be between JV and Sparrow. I said, yeah? I said, yeah, that makes sense. He says, I want you to have them to have a fight. I said, what do you mean fight? What kind of fight? He said, fist fight. He said, I want them to have a fight. Fist? You want him to have a fist fight? He says, yes, I want them to have a, a total drag out fight. I said, okay. Uh, I went back and I wrote chapter for the fight. Now, Maverick is good. He also edited, um, what is that called? The, the film that Dustin Hoffman starred in, um, The Medicis. Did you ever see that series on TV, The Medicis? That yes. was the last thing he ever, ever seen? Yoko was yes. the last book he edited, and that was the last film he Yeah, Maverick. Edited the text of one other thing, the script, which was pretty much just as good. And he said it, it was the Medici's that was on the television. It's quite good. It's a fabulous series. That's great. But anyway, so he, I mean, he changed the ground. Now, there's some agents who think they can do that. I don't know whether they can or not. I never got an agent. My next step was to send my book around. I sent my book around to about 60 agents. Um, about close to 10 of them wanted to read my book. Read my book, so I sent it to them. But they all said, nobody wants to hear about Vietnam. Um, nobody wants to hear about a boy growing up. No, I can tell you. You know, a coming of age story by the man. He said, just can't sell it. I'm sorry, but maybe I talked too much. <laughs> Are you going to have, uh, do you have copies of the book here today? Or what? I do. Anywhere without copies. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to have to um, read my cousin who can't see me. Um, and I was wanting to get a copy of your book and maybe a copy of yours. So before I leave, I can see it. Maybe. Wow, it's a great talk now. And then they have.